Welcome to Looking at the Markets with David Modell. We've got a return guest here, a special guest. He is Mr. Jacob Wall, and uh, he is uh, the founder of MontgomeryAssets.com. He's the CEO and head of Fixed Income interest rates, and one of the two architects of Montgomery's relative premium arbitrage strategy. Uh, At 16, while attending high school, Mr. Wohl started his first venture into the world of professional trading. He launched a hedge fund, an extremely successful one at that, and he received attention from around the world for being one of the youngest hedge fund managers of all time. He's been featured on Fox Business, Yahoo Finance, Bloomberg. Um, You know, he's been in the business for maybe not the longest time uh, of anybody that I've spoken to, but he's got plenty of experience and plenty of insight to share with us. He's back once again. Thank you for returning with us, Mr. Jacob Wall. Hey, great to be here, David. Uh, It's been an exciting uh, start to the year, kind of first quarter here in the markets. Uh, A lot of, you know, decoupling of, of assets that were all moving in the same direction, and that's provided a lot of uh, opportunity out there. A lot of opportunity and possibly a lot of risk, and we can talk about that. First, uh, before I forget, just want to get into uh, the company that you're in charge of, MontgomeryAssets.com. Uh, when people visit that website, uh, what can they expect to see, and what are the services offered right now? Sure. So we run a proprietary trading and asset management firm here in Los Angeles, California. Uh, there's a little bit of information on our website, obviously not Uh, the most interactive website, uh, given the nature of our business. Uh, But if anybody is interested in learning more about our company, they can go straight to that website, MontgomeryAssets.com, and send uh, a message. Uh, There's a a contact form right there on the site, and uh, I get all of those messages myself, and we'll make sure to get back to you quickly with a response. That's fantastic. I recommend people check it out. Uh, in the meantime, let's talk about what's going on in the world right now. What an exciting time to be in the markets, but maybe a little scary for some people. Uh, you've got geopolitical events going on. Uh, what should we keep in mind as investors when it comes to what's going on in North Korea and elsewhere? Sure. So I think that what is really important and what a lot of people are missing amid you know, the stories of bombing and Tomahawk missiles and everything else, is that uh, really a deal has been made between the U.S. and China. Um, after Trump decided to uh, do the strike on Syria, he once again brought uh, the United States to a point where we have the action card again. Uh, you know, before with our world standing, uh, it was known sort of with Obama that uh, the, the punishment was going to be talk, uh, followed up with perhaps stronger talk and maybe economic sanctions. Uh, but now everybody around the world knows that uh, we're back to a position where you know, the U.S. is not afraid to come to your doorstep and drop, and, and drop bombs. Uh, so you know, that changes the game a little bit. And so what you've seen happen between the U.S. and China is that the U.S. has taken China off the list of currency manipulators. Uh, that was basically a concession made uh, by by the president and by the the Treasury Secretary. And what we got in exchange for that was something very important. Uh, So what we know is that in February, China uh, passed a measure saying that uh, they were no longer going to buy coal from North Korea. Now, they passed that measure. That measure came into place uh, just after Trump's inauguration, but it was not being enforced. Uh, North Korean coal was still coming into China at a huge rate, and it wasn't being enforced. What we now see on the heels of the meeting between Chinese President Xi Jinping and President Trump is that that agreement not to buy North Korean coal is now being enforced. And not only that, but the Chinese have also said explicitly that they will be buying coal from the United States. And so what we saw was basically expert negotiation take place whereby our president said, look, we'll take you off the list of currency manipulators. We want to work together here. We don't want a trade war between the U.S. and China. That was a big fear that was priced into the marketplace and and something that people were very concerned about. And in exchange, the Chinese are going to help out with North Korea, and they're also going to be buying coal from the U.S., uh, which is going to be a huge windfall for 
um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of states, uh, particularly in the Midwest and on the East Coast, that are big coal producers. So, let's talk about actionable ideas. Uh, what are if some people are afraid that the market is a bit toppy right now, that geo- geopolitical events, although we're saying, yeah, it's stable, but people are still concerned. What should we be doing to hedge our positions, or should we be hedging our positions right now? Sure. So there's, I, I kind of want to break people into three categories for the sake of the discussion. You have sort of what I would call long-only investors. This is the vast majority of investors. Um, you have kind of long-short more tactical investors and typically the know-how is a little bit higher on that end not always but but generally and then the third category would be your ultra passive meaning you're in mutual funds you're in you know ETFs and you don't even you just buy it and put it in a desk drawer and don't even touch it if you're in that third category ultra passive and you're not retiring for 20 years you don't need that cash immediately or even in the next let's say three years just keep doing what you're doing Keep buying stocks, keep buying bonds, whatever your tactical asset allocation is, and forget about the news, uh, because over the long term, uh, you know, asset classes outperform cash. We know this. Um, stocks will outperform bonds. We know this. <clears throat> so keep doing what you're doing. Now, that we know. Talking about the other two categories, which are perhaps more active investors, uh, people that invest in individual equities and individual debt issues, uh, they have a little bit more versatility to either capitalize or on the other side of the coin lose money uh, in this kind of market environment. So talking about the long short investor, um, you know, look, do you want to short the stock market? Do you want to short the bond market? Um, Do you want to perhaps short gold? That's something that that we have kind of established as a small position in our portfolio. Look, you know, I'm not going to tell people what to do from a long short perspective because I'm sure if somebody has the audacity to go out and short the stock market, they're not going to listen to my advice anyways. Uh, So, you know, they can keep doing what they're doing as well. Now talking about the third category, which is uh, something I think I can lend some help to, is the long only investor that is perhaps a little bit more active than the mutual fund guy and is looking at where to um, find opportunities. Here's what I would say to them the anticipated outperformance of financials has not played out. Uh, Interest rates have not risen at a precipitous rate. Uh, You haven't seen an explosion in rates and a much steeper curve as was being anticipated after the election. And the reflation trade is not something that is playing out exactly the way that people thought. So for those investors, my recommendation, and you know, this is not formal financial advice, obviously, this is just kind of my thought on the marketplace sure. is that you want to be in, uh, like I said in the last po- in the last podcast, you want to be in, in, in sort of, um, I believe, non-cyclical businesses. So, you know, if we if we enter a scenario where you see that sort of tenure uh, cycle that that has taken place several times now, you know, over the past 50 years or so, um, you want to own a business where you know, is the stock price going to go down if there's a bear market? Probably, I would I would almost venture to say absolutely. Uh, that happens. But you want to own a business where even if the stock price goes down, the core business doesn't change. So I think for the sake of example here, you look at, let's say, Apple. Um, if there's a bear market, Apple stock price will go down. It's just the way it works. Now, will their business contract? I would say the answer is yes. They run a very sort of discretionary type of business. They sell phones. Um, you know, people have less spare cash on their hands, perhaps. And, um, you know, the, the, the actual business contracts. Now, you look at another business, like let's say uh, Reynolds, which is a cigarette company, a, a tobacco company. Will their stock price go down if there's an economic contraction? It certainly will. However, will their business contract? Uh, it will not. And, and what we've seen in the past is actually that during times of economic stress, um, tobacco companies do even better than they do during times of uh, good economics. Hmm. So if you're going to be an active investor, I think that you have to kind of position cautiously here. Uh, you can't uh, speculate perhaps as much as you did in the past because, you know, I don't see a sign of a, of, of a extreme bear market ahead. 
I don't see a sign of a recession ahead. However, uh, that's what that's what makes them dangerous is that no one sees them coming. Right. And so what you can do, uh, rather than trying to be, you know, uh, the, the next great predictor or the Wizard of Oz, mm. is just position yourself cautiously, not expose yourself to so much risk, and keep some cash on hand. Uh, that way, when things do get hit, uh, you can buy things at a discount. Sounds like a plan for success. Caution always advised very highly. Uh, I should mention, by the way, Jacob Wall should be checked out on Twitter at Jacob A. Wall uh, and also on his website, which is MontgomeryAssets.com. Uh, right now, does Montgomery Assets have a position in gold or other commodities? And what is your view on that for 2017? Well, I, I don't want to opine on, on crude oil because that is something where, frankly, I don't, I don't speculate on the price of, of energy. Um, I don't think that I have any edge in that marketplace. And so if I do trade energy, it's with the sort of, a, you know, uh, on a sort of more arcane, in, in, a, in a more arcane sort of way, um, you know, whether it be trading the term structure, trading volatility around it. You know, that's something that I might do. Now, with regards to tactical um, sort of positions that, that we have, um, we have uh, initiated a, a position, uh, long volatility in gold. Um, you know, do I know the future? No. All I do is try to put myself in a position to um, have favorable risk reward scenarios. And, you know, if interest rates go a lot lower, gold probably has some upside. If they don't go lower, I think gold probably has some downside. And what we've seen again and again is that gold can get up to that twelve fifty, thirteen hundred, even fourteen hundred dollar mark, perhaps, and then it just gets sold like there's no tomorrow. And so the way I look at a trade like this is, what is gold's volatility relative to what it's been in the past? And if we look at, um, let's say, the IV implied volatility percentile uh, versus the past. Uh, 52 weeks, you're sitting right now at the bottom 10th percentile of that. And so we, we put on a couple of positions that uh, would certainly benefit from a down move and or a rise in volatility in gold. Uh, so we are not, you know, long term bullish gold. Uh, I know that, you know, there's a lot of gold bugs out there. There's a lot of people that think that gold's going to go to, uh, I've heard, crazy numbers, you know, $10,000 an ounce, $64,000 an ounce. And, you know, if you think that, for whatever reason, go ahead and buy some gold. Uh, but, you know, the, the consensus view, and I think that the consensus view is, is more or less correct in this case, is that gold should be used, same goes for silver, as a currency hedge. It should make up 5 to 10% of your portfolio, and really no more than that. Uh, so if you want to be involved in the game of speculating, and you want to compete with people like me and you know people like many other hedge funds and and proprietary trading firms around the world uh, you can do that uh, you know you can open a brokerage account and you can start trading gold futures um, but if you're you're sort of a more long-term investor I think that the the safest bet with regards to gold is to uh, like the experts recommend have five or ten percent of your asset allocation in gold slash silver Sounds reasonable, and no, I do not have any intention of trying to compete against Montgomery Assets or any other hedge fund because I know I will not win <laughs> as a retail trader over and, the long. You may, you may. Well, over the long just, term, that though. would make you a statistical outlier. Right, um, right, exactly. You know, so and you, you might win. I'm not saying it's impossible to <laughs> to beat the street or anything of the sort. All I'm saying is, you know, let's let's talk about outcomes within the context of statistics. You know, like the guy that turns a thousand dollars into a million on the stock market. Let's think about that. It doesn't mean it's a fraud. It doesn't mean it's a scam, but it is a statistical outlier, and it's very unlikely that another person would achieve the same result. I totally agree. Uh, I don't have the mathematical or computational tools or the resources that any any hedge fund would have as a retail investor. I don't have those things, and so I don't even try to. I, I try to swim uh, with the current, not against it. So that's that's my own policy on that. <laughs> um, you know what? That's that's the best. I think that's the best way to go. And what I tell people a lot of times too is. Um, you know, there seems to be because you hear about it all the time on CNBC and Bloomberg. There seems to be this obsession with <clears throat> predicting things and 
calling the turn in the market and having a good war story for your friends. Right. Uh, but understand this, um, you know, most of the big up moves, whether they be daily, weekly, monthly, happen during a bull market. And most of the big down moves, again, whether they be daily, weekly, monthly, happen during a bear market. And so I always ask people, what are we in? It's clearly a bull market. So if you're looking for a big move one way or the other, um, you know, the, the statistical chance would be that you're going to see that more, more likely on the upside than on the downside. Makes sense to me. And finally, just wanted to ask about this. Uh, recently, it seems like Donald Trump may have softened his position on interest rates. Uh, he may actually want to keep them low, or at least lower than we thought, uh, or at least I thought. Uh, he might even be warming up to the idea of keeping Janet Yellen uh, around for for a while. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And are there any trades or investments that are actionable in regard to that? Well, <clears throat> Janet Yellen has been, to her credit, a very successful secretary of the Fed. Um, with very few exceptions, she has said what she's going to do and what the Fed's going to do, and then done that. And <clears throat> I don't think that that you know this president or, or any president is going to uh, sacrifice the integrity and the independence of the Federal Reserve. Uh, so, you know, while President Trump's comments may move the interest rate market and the dollar and gold in the short term, um, I, I don't see that being a, a, a concrete kind of actionable thing that, that really moves markets over any sustain, you know, any long-term period of time. So with regards to the Fed, uh, just today, we received new inflation numbers. They they disappointed. They came in a little bit low. And you know what we saw uh, basically since June of 2016 is that there there began to be this very crowded trade around tips or Treasury inflation protected securities. Basically, people betting that inflation would go up. That was a good bet for a while. Inflation was very underpriced with respect to the curve, and that worked out. And now what you're seeing is that people got a little bit too head over heels about inflation. They thought it would come a little bit too quickly. I think that's due in part to the language that had come out of the Fed and other central banks. And when the Japan number came out just a few weeks ago and their inflation sort of disappointed, I began to develop the opinion that perhaps the same would happen here. So I think that we need to see a little bit more data and, and sort of see how this plays out. But, you know, I now, air towards the side of seeing the Fed moving very, very quickly as less likely. I think that um, perhaps the Fed will need to be more cautious than, than otherwise thought. And you're seeing certain Fed governors like Neil Kashkari say that um, they may need to do some balance sheet unwinding before they even raise rates. And on the surface, that sounds like it, it may be something they'll consider. So, you know, my view on the Fed is don't fight the Fed. Listen to what the Fed says. And don't get into the business of speculating on um, minutia with regards to what they say and what they do. Uh, so, you know, the Fed is going to be cautious. The Fed is, is, in my view, not going to crash the market. They're not conspiring against Trump. Uh, none of this kind of kooky stuff that you hear out there on the Internet. Um, so you know, the, Fed, the Fed really doesn't matter a whole lot with regards to a, what a long-term investor does. So... I would not be overly concerned if you are a long-term investor about reading the minutes and, and you know, overweighting what the Fed's doing. A call for sanity. I like it. Yeah. In a crazy market, uh, you know, sounds like Montgomery Assets is holding steady and, uh, you know, just keeping with the same sound, conservative investing policies that they always have had and that have been so successful. If people want to tap into that resource or they want to, if they want to contact you, uh, how can they do that? Uh, you know, the best way to see what I'm thinking at any given time uh, would be to visit my Twitter. They can just Google Jacob Wool or uh, it's at Jacob A. Wool. I'm the, the verified one, not, not the other ones out there. Right. Uh, and they can also uh, go ahead and just, again, visit our website, montgomeryassets.com. Uh, we also post a lot of blogs on Seeking Alpha and on my LinkedIn where we talk about the marketplace. And so there's a, a wealth of material that we put out there on the Internet. And, uh, you know, people are free to take a look at it and, and do with it what they will. Fantastic. And I hope that people continue 
and I know they will, continue to take advantage of all the resources that you have to, you and your firm have to offer. Thank you again. You're welcome back anytime. Mr. Jacob Wool, thank you, sir, for joining me today. Hey, it's, it's great to be here, David, and keep up the good work with the show. Thank you, sir. Ha 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 ha!